I, we just didn't know at that time. We had no idea that you could, you know, that you could be hit on your head and, and, and especially if repetitive and not necessarily horrific injuries, but the small hits could lead to you becoming a brain damaged uh, older adult. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son, Troy, each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. Dr. Julian Bales is a leading figure in neurosurgery and brain injury research recognized for his extensive work on the impact of brain injuries on cognitive function, with a career marked by significant contributions to understanding and treating brain injuries. Bales has served as a consultant to the NFL Players Association since 1994, supporting research on head injuries among professional athletes. He is also the medical director of the Center for Study of Retired Athletes at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and has been involved with Pop Warner football, implementing safety measures to protect young athletes. His collaboration with Dr. Bennett Omalu led to the identification of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE, in football players, highlighting the long-term effects of repeated head impacts. Bale's commitment to improving player safety extends through his advisory roles and his push for policy changes in youth sports to minimize head impacts and concussions. His research and advocacy efforts aim to make contact sports safer for all participants, from professional athletes to children. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Dr. Julian Bales, it's an honor to have you with us today. Thank you, Tim. Great to be with you. How does a kid from small town Louisiana become one of the best brain surgeons in the world? Well, I, I probably should disclose that I believe the way you found out that I'm one of the best is that I told you. So I don't know if you have a, any independent <laughs> verification. but uh well uh probably because i realized early on in life i really had no other talents or abilities so i decided to, i thought i could be a surgeon and work in my hands so that's probably how, how i did it i think also a surgeon has to really have uh, an affinity for the organ that he's operating on so i guess if you love the heart you become a cardiothoracic surgeon and, and i like the the brain the central nervous system and then I also liked uh, working with my hands for microsurgery, fine things, because when we operate on the brain, we usually operate magnified about 25 times. And then finally, you, you can't have an aversion or not want to take care of seriously ill patients, whether it's cancer or injury or what other. So that those are the sort of the things that attracted me to the field. Did you know when you were young, Dr. Bells, that you wanted to be a doctor and a surgeon, or what, when did you, I guess, at what age did you decide to go that path? No, I wanted to be a defensive lineman for the Atlanta Falcons. That's really what I wanted to be, but I didn't have that kind of talent, so that was my default. I promise I won't ask you about the movie the whole time, but I have to ask, how did it feel having Alec Baldwin playing you? Well, it, it was an honor to have a uh, great actor like him play me. And, and when I've been asked about it, I've always said that, you know, he, he really 
from what I saw, put a lot into it. In my discussions with him, he uh, tried to understand the, the subject matter very well, and, and he was respectful and, and really a consummate professional. So, um, yeah, it was a great honor f- for me. Did they consult with you to make the movie more realistic? Oh, they, they they did, and you know the uh, the the writer and the and the director was Peter Landisman, and the producer was the world famous Ridley Scott. So they they were both, and they, everyone they worked you know at the at with them at a high level were very uh, very much into it, and very much, uh, in my opinion, wanted to know the truth and to tell the story. And, and at the end of the day, one of the things I was most proud of was that it was rated PG-13. And that's one of my pet peeves about Hollywood. How many times do you want to watch a good movie? And then they ruin it, in my opinion, by the language or other gratuitous things when they're, they're really, I think you need more talent and ability artistically to tell the story. And in this case, to emphasize the science behind it. And that's what, uh, that was one of the biggest things about it that was positive to me. How does, uh, how did that whole thing, for anyone who hasn't seen the movie, I guess, can you tell us a little bit about that, that kind of journey specifically? You don't have to give us the, the two hour movie synopsis, but you can give us the, the, uh, I guess how it came up, what the story is, and, and then ultimately how it led to a movie. Well, there, there was an interest by s- several people in, in making a movie based on the kind of dis- modern discovery of CTE. And, uh, there were, the, they had the, they, they had the finances to do it. They had uh, Columbia Sony Pictures. So they had a studio and they had a, a good, good writer and director and producer, as I mentioned. So they, uh, contacted me and said they were going to, uh, make this movie and that they wanted to focus upon my colleague, the neuropathologist, the Nigerian, uh, Bennett Amalu, who I had worked with in the early days of this and, uh, and myself. And after hearing it, I said, well, well, I'll tell you the truth. I'm really not interested because, uh, ever since we've tried to come out with this, everybody's been mad at us. Uh, uh you know, players, uh, uh, the NFL coaches. Um, a lot of fans, but we were trying to shine light on the fact that in a, in a select few, and I think that that number, that percentage is getting less and less now because of all the reforms, uh, in a select few, they could have, uh, some relationship to chronic, uh, degenerative, neurodegenerative disease that's been, been now named and known as CTE. And when you when you tried to come out about it, you guys obviously faced a lot of opposition that you mentioned from players in the NFL. Um, why do you think that was? Do you think it was just they were afraid of that hurting the game? Yeah, I think in large part there was confusion about it. There's probably fear about it, and uh, you know it wasn't a fun story to tell. It wasn't a feel good story. It was a it was a bad feel bad feel story. If, if you will, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't something positive other than like most things in life. If you understand the truth and, and the principles behind what you're seeing in the end, it should lead to something good. And I hope that's happened. Well, there's been a lot of changes, obviously, to the NFL. Like you just mentioned a lot of the rules and, and uh, procedures and stuff like that. And, and you sounds like you think that those have made a big difference. I, I, I do. And, you, you know, the, the amount of head trauma and gratuitous head contact that used to occur, you know, not that many years ago, 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, pales in comparison now to the incidence of, of uh, head impacts. And it's not just we've learned the number of concussions. Concussions probably are a lesser factor. They may be a surrogate for how long you played or what position it was played. But it's really the, the, it's like what I call a, a dose paradigm. It's how many repetitive hits to the head you had. And it's not, doesn't correlate necessarily with being knocked out or with a, a known or diagnosed concussion. But it's, did you have, you know, 800 a year in, in high school? Did you have a thousand or more, uh, in college? And then it's been, uh, we, we don't really have good data at the NFL or professional leagues level. 
Uh, so it's the dose. It's like how many packs of cigarettes do you smoke? And that's a that's an exposure paradigm in, in medicine and epidemiology uh, is how much exposure you had. So I think that was one of the most important things that was learned, and that led to a lot of reforms. Uh, the NFL, once they got behind it, I think have done a, a lot of a lot of good things, and maybe almost about what they can do. They've eliminated egregious open field hits, they've uh, blindside hits, uh, and and really tried to eliminate head targeting, launching, uh, spearing, things like that. Do you, do you think it's, you know, in, in layman's terms, because I'm not a brain surgeon, it's almost like everybody has like a like a pitch count almost on hits to the head they can take. And it's very, it's, it's an individualized thing, right? There's not, they don't have any indication of once you go over X, then you're at higher risk. Is it, is that right? Uh, no, we don't know exactly how many hits. And there may be some uh, genetic factors not been discovered yet, but there may be some people obviously are more predisposed than others because the vast majority don't get CT who played even in the previous era. Uh, so we don't really know. It's just we, we know that less is better. And certainly if concussions or some effect of the brain is identified, a, an appropriate amount of time off uh, to allow healing to occur. What was the fallout, if any, with the Steelers and the NFL after you came forward and essentially changed the game? For the better, I might add. Well, in the in the you know the initial days, I think there was uh, they were incredulous, they were skeptical, and they were doubting. Uh, there were congressional hearings in two thousand nine, and I testified there. Commissioner Goodell testified, and several other people. And I think that was kind of a turning point where they began to really look at trying to do everything they could to reform the game. It, at the end of the day, uh, although they uh, did not like the message, I think they got behind it and they have made the reforms. And it remains a contact sport, as you well know, and, and people have to accept that, knowing that it's safer now than it's ever been. So, Dr. Bales, some people have CTE. Well, I, I don't know enough about this to, to uh, probably articulate it the right way, but so people have CTE, but it doesn't, they don't show any signs of it. So a lot of, a lot of people, to your point earlier, that a lot of people don't show or don't have CTE. I thought I read that people, a lot of people percentage wise do have CTE, like in their brain, but you can't see it. There's no signs that there's no, there's no change in their behavior. Like they don't die from CTE, but after their brain goes and gets studied, it, it appears that they did have CTE. Is that, is that right? Well, there are people who uh, a, a big a big part of the problem here is that you can't make a diagnosis when someone's still alive. I mean, maybe you can. A doctor who's an expert may may speculate that's what it is, but you can't make a definitive diagnosis until after death, when the brain has an autopsy. Uh, so it's it's very hard hard to know who may have it and who may not who may have minor changes or minor stages and and not have the full-blown CTE. And then this, this has also led to and spurred further interest in scientific study and, you know, the, the tau and the amyloid proteins, which are what we see as breakdown products in the brain. They're found at autopsy. What, are, what does it mean? How dense are they? What location in the brain are they? So people can have CTE changes in the brain, but not have CTE symptoms, which I think was your question. Yeah. But most of the people who have advanced CTE changes have uh, have symptoms. And the symptoms are, are, are two basic categories. In younger people, in their 30s or 40s, it's more behavioral and emotional and psychological, and then in the older group, 60s to 70s, it's more, um, uh, you, you know, loss of function, memory disturbance, inability to walk or take care of oneself. So it's, it's it mimics dementia uh, in the older group. And you went to West Virginia after that, right? I know you have five kids. 
did you go to West Virginia so you didn't have to move away from your kids? Well, that was actually, you know, I was 10 years in Pittsburgh and then I went to Morgantown, West Virginia, which is about 45 minutes south. And we still had an office in the Pittsburgh area. So I was in the same general location for about 20 years. And in the second half of that 20 years is really when we got into this, into this issue, studying brains, getting more brains to study. Uh, in the past, that was very uncommon that anyone, any research group would study brains after people died. Uh, only, usually only in dementia had that been done. So it was, uh, an unusual ask. It was innovative and it was, uh, uh, you know, uh, unprecedented really that people would ask that we would ask or other researchers would ask for, uh, you know, once you die, let us study your brain sort of thing. And, and especially in people who had been exposed to multiple head injuries or multiple repetitive head impacts. And in some cases, the military veterans who had been exposed to multiple IED blasts. When your work on CTE got published, did that cause you and the Pittsburgh Steelers to part ways? Uh, I, I had actually already left the, the Steelers by that time. Uh, so uh, I think we've maintained a good relationship. As you know, they're a great franchise run by a great football family, and, and uh, uh, they have since established – uh, the Chuck Knoll Foundation, because Chuck Knoll apparently famously said, you know, for brain injury, which no one could see, he's, you know, show me some data, show me some objective data. So, uh, they, they, uh, funded and, uh, embarked on the Chuck Knoll Foundation. And I'm on the board, scientific board. And, and our charter really is to, is to fund projects and, and support research. Uh, for better understanding of brain injury, particularly as it relates to sports. How much progress has there been made on the, the medical side, Dr. Bell, of these CTEs? Well, I, I, I believe a lot has been made on, on, number one, establishing that this could happen. Again, I think it's the minority of people, but it's certainly a possibility. Whatever the number is, it's important. Uh, there's been there's been positive changes as we've discussed in rules and style of play and practice and and uh, and avoiding unnecessary hits to the head when possible. Um, so I, I think there has been you know a lot a lot of improvement and uh, I'm not sure there's a whole lot more to do actually uh, if you're going to continue with the contact sport. And I know there's been some. Not not uh, disagreement. I guess just some some. Uh, well, I guess disagreement, but in a in a cordial way between you and and your colleagues. And the, I think the person who wrote the book, concussion about they were saying. I think your your uh, former co uh, colleague there was saying that he doesn't think kids should be allowed to play football until they're eighteen. And um, the writer of the book, concussion, said even if you could find a way to get ten foot wide helmets on players, at the end of the day. The brain is in a liquid and is going to hit the skull if there's contact. And I think you were more um, on the pro football side of things, I guess, of letting people play, just doing it in a safer way. Is that is that accurate? Uh, yeah, there there has been a faction which has advocated for eliminating tackle football until you get to be 18 or or 14, whatever the their their argument may be. I I disagree with that for several reasons. One is that there's really not a, a high chance or, or probability of people who have played youth football to have CTE. It's basically not been reported, and there may be uh, one or two cases where they've raised the question. But uh, CTE, brain injury, is, I think, again, a lot, the incidence or risk is a lot less than it used to be. Uh, it's important, though, that, that youth football, if we're going to take that, that population, it's very important that they play by rules which emphasize and use safety as the number one priority. So, for instance, in Pop Warner football in 2013, all head contact in practice was eliminated. Uh, it would only be inadvertent if it happened. So there could be, at that point, no more drills where they start and run and hit each other. Uh, 
Uh, also, the the uh, the kickoff for the younger players has been eliminated. So so the youth football, particularly at Pop Warner level, uh, where there's maybe four thousand games every weekend, they have to adhere to these rules. The coaches have to take USA football training uh, for awareness and safety training. Um, the concussion rate in youth football is less than one percent a year. And the number of head impacts, uh, we think, is 60 or less as opposed to 800 in, in, or so in high school. So, you know, where do you draw the line? There's not a whole lot of difference between 14 and 15. I think you have to stick with strict safety uh, rules, safety training, uh, avoiding unnecessary contact in practice, not have this ubiquitous head-to-head -head hitting of linemen on every play, for instance. But look, uh, Pop Warner football has had fly football for, I don't know, years, and not many people play it. Uh, if someone doesn't want to play and the, the parents or the athlete don't, don't want to play or they don't accept the risk, then they shouldn't play. Nobody's making them play. Do, do you think this might be a, um, just a totally ignorant question, but do you, th like, youth players, are they able to generate enough force? to have that same kind of – if you see, if you turn on an NFL game and there's people who are, you know, my dad, 250 pounds and run a four, five, 40-yard dash hitting each other, it's a it's a lot more force, obviously. And, and uh, I have to imagine, you know, it's a lot worse for your brain than when kids are hitting, or is it is it just as bad at scale for kids because the brain is less developed? No, that's an important – point because uh you know when someone gets from 14 to 15 they're becoming man sized and they have speed and they have body weight and so the 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 velocity and the in the impact forces are much greater than when they're younger so where do you draw the line i think you have to do it on all these safety uh innovations that have been done and the rules changes and so forth so yeah when you're getting in high school you're you're really subject to a lot greater forces and especially if there are repetitive head head impacts over the course of a year or a season is there one rule change that you think has made the biggest impact or do you think it's just a collection of all of them i guess uh, overall, it's the collection of the rules and, and especially the eliminating of, of a lot of contact at practice during the season. If you had to pick one rule, it would probably be uh, hitting a defenseless player blindsided or particularly coming over the, the middle of the field. That would probably be the single biggest rule. But it's really in conglomerate all these changes, which I think have had the added benefit. I know that the NFL has had some some plays where maybe the media or or the fans now with social media can be more vocal, where they've had like a little bit of uh, I don't know, hot water is probably too much, but a lot of people pointing out where a player appears to have a concussion and going back in the game, or you know the NFL people accusing the NFL of not following you know concussion protocol as well as they should have and things like that. Do you do you think do you um, I guess do you agree with that or do you think that they're following it? pretty well uh, overall I, I believe it's being followed well there can always be examples uh, of, of where it isn't but I think for the most part considering the complexity of all of this that uh, they, it is being followed well um, if there if you could change one more rule in the NFL to if someone said you can change you know you could make a rule change to, to help reduce it what would you what would you do or do you think we've reached the the maximum rule changes we can without changing the game fundamentally. The the only other thing I believe could be done is taking the lineman out of three point stance because you have uh, this uh, ubiquitous, uh, again gratuitous head contact on every play for the offensive and defensive linemen. So if there's a way to mitigate that, it would be to take take them out of their down stance, particularly offensive linemen that. They already do that some on a lot of pass plays. And the other, the other high injury uh, uh, play is a kickoff or a punt. So the, just as we did in youth football, should they consider uh, eliminating the, those two plays or one of those plays because they're the high velocity and one of the highest injury plays? It seems like, too, with the rule changes on that where they moved 
the kickoffs around a little bit. It seems like there's a lot more fair catches or touchbacks than there were. And there definitely is stati- like statistically wise. So it seems like they've already watered that down so much. It, it doesn't seem like that big of a stretch to think that they could just take the kickoff right out and just start yeah. at 25 or something like that. We coached Troy's younger brother, Ty, in a league that, wasn't through Pop Warner a few years back. I'm proud to say that we rarely had contact in practice for that exact reason. Well, that's great. You were ahead of your time before it became more or less uh, popular to do that or, or better accepted or, or more obvious. So you were ahead of the time and probably you've influenced a lot of people in a positive way to consider that it's unnecessary and, uh, Hopefully, at every level, that will continue to happen. I know the the lineman hits to your point about the you know the gratuitous head collisions, especially in practice. My dad used to say, I used to ask him about the games and how brutal the games must have been in the NFL. And he said the games were so easy compared to practice. Because practice, you'd run double or triple the amount of plays, and you'd do two of them in one day. And the amount of head collisions would be, you know, versus an NFL game, maybe it's 40 plays, maybe it's 60 plays on offense and defense. And in practice, he said yes. they're running, you know, in the hundreds. Yes, and when we looked in, you know, the first the first kind of modern case of CTE was the former Pittsburgh Steelers center, Mike Webster. And it, it, when we went back and interviewed, uh, first of all, it was estimated that he had an interview with his former teammates and coaches that he had uh, probably over 100,000 blows to the head. So that's just, you know, by modern days, pretty insane. But we didn't know any better. And in a way, it wasn't anyone's fault because the science wasn't uh, understood and the, and the issues of CT had not been brought forth. But there's nothing like that anymore. And those same players would say under Chuck Noll that, the, the games on Sunday would be a walk in a park compared to the, the five days a week they were hitting on every, at every practice pretty much full speed. And it's probably the way it was in the Tim Green era as well. I think that's what you're describing. Yeah, I think um, just for like a timeline too, when I was playing in football in college, they, that rule changed while I was playing that they could no longer do two days with full contact. My freshman year, we could, and my sophomore year, we couldn't. And my dad, when I told him the rule, I was, you know, saying how happy I was it changed. And he, he was saying they used to do three a day as full contact. So one a day was like under. Yeah. under it's, it's almost by today's standards, insanity, a definition of insanity, right? Three a day is full contact starting August or four or five weeks, right? Yeah, I don't even know how they made it through. I guess there were a lot of – there were so many more injuries but just full contact two times a day i know the injuries have dropped a lot going to one i can't imagine <laughs> three so dr bales you you grew up in a small town in northern louisiana was church a part of the picture if so did faith ever have a big impact on your life i asked because you emailed me last week and made a kind remark about my strength i wanted to let you know that whatever strength i have comes from Jesus. Yeah, great, great to know. Yeah, I'm glad you clarified that. But uh, uh, many, so many people admire you. They admire you as an athlete, and they admire you now, and your your courage to face this and and to promote the changes or the improvements that can be made. Uh, yeah, I grew up in Louisiana, and uh, the football was king, and uh, it was. Probably my whole life uh, growing up as a kid, I played 10 years. When I was 20, I injured my neck and later had surgery. So that ended my career. And I decided, you know, I better really hunker down if I want to get through pre-med and get accepted to medical school, which I did. So I went to LSU as an undergraduate and LSU med school in New Orleans. Um, and um, then came to Chicago for the neurosurgery tra- internship and neurosurgery training. I trained in other places as well, New York City and Los Angeles and Phoenix, but the bulk of it was six years was for that primary purpose. Um, and I, I'll mention too, in Louisiana, well, really everywhere, uh, even in Syracuse, I know it gets hot in August, but Louisiana, we were battling 
you know, two a days uh, with the summer heat. And that was, that was brutal. And uh, I'm glad that that is over. With. Yeah. And certainly faith uh, is important for all of us and, and to try to have the conviction to bring forward uh, the things which you think are important and uh, would, would help people or help advance science. So yeah, definitely. Switching gears, as I said, you have a full slate of operations on people's brains and spines. Do you have a favorite operation? Um, my favorite is probably brain aneurysm surgery, which is what I did special training in after I finished my regular neurosurgery training. And I went to the world famous Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix for that. Uh, we don't do a whole lot of surgeries on those anymore because in, in the modern day now, they're done by what's called endovascular techniques, just going up through the artery and the groin or through the wrist artery and putting a catheter up into the brain and blocking the aneurysm off. Used to, all those patients needed their heads open up. They needed surgery to fix an aneurysm. Uh, so that was traditionally my, my uh, greatest interest, believe it or not. Uh, now I, I do probably mainly brain tumor surgery. So those, a lot of those patients have cancerous brain tumors, and we try to do our best to help them out. Many of them we can't, most of them we can't ultimately cure. We can hopefully make their life better and extend it, and, and uh, we continue to try to do research on that area. Uh, but those, are, those, are, those two have been traditionally my favorite. You so casually mentioned opening up somebody's brain there, you know, opening up their head that made me, that made it both my dad and I saw we both kind of, we, we both uh, uh, squirmed in our seats, but you say, oh, we just opened their head right up. <laughs> well, I, you know, it's all I know how to do. If I couldn't do that, I'd be un absolutely unemployed. So I, uh, I, you have to love it, right? Otherwise, who would do it? But it is fascinating. And if, uh, as I said earlier, if the brain is your favorite organ, why wouldn't you want to? go in there and try to tinker with it or fix it, right? So, yeah, it's a labor of love, and I've done it for a long time, and uh, we're continuing to learn. There's always advancements in technology, and a lot of things we do now are computer-assisted, uh, robotics, and, uh, and uh, you know, we're getting into brain-computer interface as well. So, uh, yeah, it's fascinating. It's addictive, but... It's time consuming and doesn't lead to a lot of hobbies, but that's okay. It's, uh, you know, it's what I find the most interesting. What, what's the addictive part of it? You, you mentioned that you find it addictive. Is it the, the it, it's, or it, it's probably the effort that has to be put forward to solve the problem. It's the complexity of it. And, you know, there's something called a flow state and it's a kind of a psychology term. You probably know about it, which to me means, you know, when your skill set exactly matches the problem at hand, and particularly if you're working manually or as we do operating through a microscope, when it exactly matches, you're supposed to transcend time. So many of our operations are six hours, sometimes eight hours, and they don't seem that long because you're so engrossed in it. And we've all had flow state experiences, whether it's, you know, a kid working on a carburetor or any other project when the when the challenge sort of matches your skill set that's when it's really fun so i think it's best explained in that way what patient traveled the farthest to have you operate on his or her brain well how, how far did they travel well sometimes they they're international patients sometimes they're national patients and it depends on uh, our setup one of my colleagues really kind of specializes in having an international presence. So we, uh, I work with him sometimes, Dr. Amin Kassam. And uh, uh, anybody who wants to come, and of course, I'm in Chicago, so there's a lot of people here. Uh, so there's no shortage of uh, patients who need, need uh, good surgery and good treatment plans. You mentioned the increase in technology. How much of it you know, just just round numbers. If back when you first started, it was again. I'm making this up. I have no idea. Ninety percent human and ten percent technology. Is it now? You know, what would you say it is now comparatively to what it was when you first started? 
it's a lot more computer assisted. You know, believe it or not, when we first started 25 years ago, you know, we were using rulers and measuring and doing calculations and angles. And now we have cameras in the ceiling. We have like a GPS system that takes us right to where we want to go. And, but we still have to know how to fly the plane manually as well. Sure. Uh, but it's, it, it's heavily computer assisted. What do you think of brain implant technology? For example, Elon Musk's company, Neuralink. Uh, I, I think it's fascinating. Um, y- you know, there's, um, I've done some work in that area, and my real interest is going inside the brain. The brain is about a three-pound organ, and the work thus far has been on the surface. Uh, either going through the, the major venous sinus or is Neuralink, his company has a electrode array that goes right under the surface. But, you know, 99% of the brain's architecture and functionality is, is inside, deep inside in many cases. So I think there's a lot to be done. The brain's the last organ to be really figured out in terms of computer enabled or electronically uh, uh, enabled or benefited. So I, I think that, uh, you know, Neuralink, his company is, uh, is very important. Number one, it's generating a lot of interest in publicity and probably funding and valuations for this emerging field of brain computer interface or BCI. So it's a very important concept. And the, the others that are in that area are in early stages, just some very early trials, but it's fascinating. And hopefully, uh, sooner than later, we'll, we'll yield some real advances. That's what I was going to ask you. What, what do you think the, what do you think the ceiling, I guess in the short term, what do you think the ceiling is, um, with that stuff? Do you think everyone always thinks, you know, like as soon as you start talking about, uh, brains and technology, they, they picture cyborgs or something like that. But what do you think is actually realistic? I know with Neuralink, it got reported, um, not very, you know, very recently that the person, the first person who got it made a recovery and could move a, I think move a mouse and a computer screen. But we know from looking into it with my, with my dad, um, this, this is still a very slow speed. Um, not just Neuralink, this whole BCI industry, like you mentioned, what do you think that in the next three to five years, or what do you think that the you know, top side, what could that really look like? A great, great question, and I don't really know the answer. It it seems agonizingly slow to watch these things come out. And as as you and your dad are aware, it takes so long to do a clinical trial to go to the regulatory uh, issues and and the funding issues, not to mention the technology. What are you going to put in? Uh, I think in the next uh, three to five years, we're on the cusp of a breakthrough either for movement, uh, for speech, um, um, and, and certainly many, many people with dementia hope that there could be some, some improvement uh, and reduction of the things that cause uh, Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. So I think we're, th- this is soon going to hit an inflection point, and it's going to be more, uh, more uh, discoveries and more uh, uh, technology that's invented and so forth. So I think uh, it's in the near future. In in layman's terms, Dr. Bales, do you think to get to that point that you're talking about, do you think that they have to go deeper in the brain or can they achieve that at the surface level? Uh, we'll, we'll find out. I, I don't know, but it, certainly the surface level is uh, easier and maybe safer. Well, but there's no place in the brain I can't get to. But the question is, you know, what would you put in it? What's the technology and how would it work? So a lot of, a lot of questions uh, to be answered. Uh, But for now, whatever we can get, whether it's surface or something else, we would, we'd gladly embrace the continued research and understanding. Is that the most exciting thing in your field? Like, I mean, obviously there's probably a lot more practical things that are, uh, maybe smaller steps that are exciting, but in the in the in the world of the brain, and your passion is that kind of the, uh, I guess the highest ceiling, the the unicorn type uh, technology, or are there other things out there that 
or maybe less reported on that are in that same. Um, I, I think that's very exciting. I think uh, the issue of the blood brain barrier, where the brain's the only organ that's isolated from drugs getting in, and most drugs cannot get in, and the ones that get in usually get kicked out by an active transport mechanism. Uh, so I think BCI, I think the blood brain barrier is another very important concept. Uh, because as a pharmaceutical company, if its scientists want to develop a new drug, you know, they typically spend the first few years trying to make sure they can get it into the brain. Uh, so those two things are, to, to me, the most uh, interesting and where, where the, a lot of advances are going to be made. None of your boys played football, did they? Was that because you just thought football wasn't worth the risks? I know Troy is planning on not letting his boys play. Well, you know, I, I told you I played from age 10 to 20, and I always say that when I return back home to Louisiana, none of my family or friends can remember my career with any specificity. But for me, it was arguably the most important thing. And uh, um, I allowed them to play. There were two that played in middle school. Uh, I'm Unfortunately, they they proved my wife, their mother, my wife's uh, suspicion that they were really all about the look, the Under Armour, the sweatbands, and all that, and they weren't contact guys. But at the end of the day, that was okay. That's we gave them the chance. And I encouraged them, and when they didn't want to do it, they became golfers. So that's not such a bad thing. But you know, you both played, and you know, if you don't have that that lust and that love for contact is not the right sport for you. Play something else. Uh, so I think that that if you know I get asked that often by parents, uh, is it okay for my son to play? And I say, yeah, as long as you play in, a, in as long as he plays in a in a league where the coaches follow the rules, they know about health and safety, and they don't have contact in practice. They don't do excessive contact. And they respect if someone may have a concussion or symptoms and they reduce repetitive head injury as much as possible. And the athlete and the parents understand the risk and what the symptoms are. You know, absolutely. I think they should play. And the incidence of having anything bad at the youth level is extremely rare. No fatality should occur. No bad concussions. But they have to accept the risk. But on the other hand, there are what a hundred kids every year get played, get killed riding bicycles. So I always tell them also, if they're not playing football and going to games and practice or activities, what will they be doing? They, it's not going to be necessarily risk aversive activity. So when you raise your kids, obviously you you weigh the pros and cons. But if if one of my three had wanted to play longer, they certainly could, as long as those criteria were met. My my biggest fear with youth, to me, I, I agree with what you're saying. I think it's a risk reward that parents and kids need to make and their kids need to make, you know, together in such a personal thing. For me, my biggest fear with football stuff, and obviously I, I have probably a pretty big bias with my dad's situation that I think for my own kids, um, I have really young, really young sons. I, I don't think I would let play as we sit here today. But um, also, too, the, the, what you said about the coaches, especially in youth sports and high, you know, all the way through, really, high school coaches down to Pop Warner, most of them are volunteering their time and whatever, and they're not. If you have a high school coach who's reckless with 15-, 16-year-old kids having them run and hit in ways that are totally unsafe, um, you hear stories and you see clips online or you see it in person even. Football, when it's not done the right way, it's such, it's such a violent game. And it, 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 the violence can be avoided in controlled scenarios, like you mentioned earlier, practice especially. And when you see things, like you, you see there's a lot, again, a lot of famous like, uh, or viral clips online of kids running 10, 20 yards sprinting into each other and one kid just being unconscious. If that that just makes like my skin crawl. I can't I can't stand that stuff. No, ho hopefully those days will come to an end. But you're exactly right. That's not what it should be. Yeah, and and, and it is a. I'm sure, like you mentioned, I sure I'm sure that's a minority um, 
you know, and most most of the time that's not the case. But if every time one of those situations comes up, everybody hears about it because it's a story. But it probably is extremely rare. Yeah, it must be a great feeling knowing that you've made the game that you love safer, right? Or do you not love football the same anymore? Well, well, it is, and and it hasn't been necessarily uh, a road without bumps, as as you well know. But I think overall, uh, it it always was, and it remains my favorite sport. I sort of think it's become America's favorite sport, and uh, it can only last if people want to play, and mothers want, and fathers want their kids to play, and and it's as safe as it can be, but. My contention has always been that there's a certain certain number of the male population that want and need contact, and, and they love the sport for the other beautiful parts of it. 22, 22 men coming together and, and battling in a very complicated scheme. You know, Europeans and other others come here, and they can't understand it. It's too many moving parts, and, it, you know, it's a game if you didn't kind of grow up with, it's hard to appreciate it or understand it. So, yeah, I think it's so important. Anything that we can do to make it better, safer, uh, I, I'm proud of that, yes. So you don't have any, you don't feel any ill will to the, I guess, to the sport overall about, you know, your your discoveries and how they pushed back, all that kind of stuff? Uh, I, I, I don't, and, you know, you can remember, Probably when you started playing, and certainly when your dad played and I played, if you hit somebody really hard in the head, that was a good thing. That was an accomplishment. That was putting your head in there was really the object of a good of a good form tackle or block or something. But I, we just didn't know at that time. We had no idea that you could, you know, that you could be hit on your head and 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 especially if repetitive and not necessarily horrific injuries, but the small hits could lead to you becoming a brain damaged uh, older adult. So we just didn't know that was the case until these findings came out. Yeah, that's why I have a little bit of that. Truthfully, I have I have some uh, I have some uh, bad blood, I guess. I love but but I it's football was so important in my life and life lessons learning how to be a man, um, the ups and the downs, handling adversity, friends, uh, family, you know, like all, so much stuff. So many, how to be as, how to work as a team, hard work on your own to, to get the results later. It's such a big part of my life. When my dad first got diagnosed, I was actually still playing. And I stopped like right around that time. And I was like, I, I intentionally tried to stop watching the NFL and stop watching college. I was like, so, I was so bitter about it. And the funny thing is, I, I still don't watch nearly like I did before. I used to watch every single every single game if it was on, I would watch it. And now, really, um, my dad and my two brothers and I, my sisters too, sometimes my mom, but mostly the we joke and say the four brothers. My dad likes to he, he likes to pretend he's one of the one of the brothers, not the old man. But we'll go watch the uh, we watch every Falcons game together, like every Falcons game we watch it, and then. Uh, Sometimes we we'll watch other games or big games and Super Bowl or something like that. But every, you know, it's like I have I have this um, bad blood just because of my dad's situation. But the game is so there's a beauty to it that's hard to explain. You get it. I mean, you've got the you clearly have the bug, too. But there's a beauty to the game that people who if you have it, it's, it's hard to explain. But it's like it's so intoxicated. Well, you're right. That's well put. And, you know, we that played understand why. And all your dad's been through, he probably still has a great love, a certain part of it, great love for the sport. Uh, and he was such a great player. Uh, so it does give a lot to all of us who played. And they're, they're unforgettable lessons, like you said. Uh, it's It's been termed that, you know, there's no other greater example of a sport where you get knocked down in the dirt on every play and then you got to get up and, and do it again and gather yourself and, and try to win the next battle. So, yeah, there's a lot of analogies and a lot of good things. Yeah, for sure. My dad's, he's, he's, uh, he's still totally pro NFL. He loves it and, and says, if you go back, you would do it again. And yeah. 
So I, I don't, I don't want to make it sound like he's, I'm, I'm a lot more bitter than he is. And maybe, maybe I shouldn't be, but it's, it's hard. Well, that's good to hear. I know this is going to sound crazy at first, but do you think it would be safer without helmets? Well, it, yeah, it probably would be. I probably would be, ironically. Uh, as you know, the helmet, I think first helmet, the modern helmet with a polycarbonate shell and some sort of suspension it probably came out in the 1930s. Before that was a leather helmet. But what I always say is that, you know, for those of us who were propensed to stick our head in there, the helmets actually encouraged uh, uh, the head-to-head -head contacts and uh, uh, a feeling of maybe in invincibility. And, you know, when we were all kids playing sandlock football or whatever in the in the backyard or on the field, uh, you you would play very rough and slam people, but you would never run cranium to cranium against another person. And that's what's happened in football. And the problem with the brain is that it's floating inside the skull in CSF, cerebral spinal fluid. And there's about a centimeter or half a centimeter of play. So when the helmeted head hits, uh, it stops, but the brain continues to slosh back and forth, and the helmet can't prevent that. And this is the same thing that the automobile industry learned in the 1950s. You don't make a, a football player safer by building a helmet uh, with bigger and bigger padding and so forth as they've done. Just like in the automobile industry, they didn't make the occupants of a crash safer by putting more and more layers of steel on the outside of the car. They did it by airbags and by three-point fixation seat belts. So when a crash came, the, the person or the occupants were not sloshing around and absorbing energy. If they maintained uh, without movement, the energy would pass through. That's called elastic collisions, where the, where the moving body does not absorb energy. So I've worked for the last several years on a device called a Q collar, which it goes around the neck. You may have seen it, and it puts uh, sort of general pressure, a couple pound pressure on the jugular vein, which enables more blood to stay in the head, maybe a tablespoon, and that kind of limits the dead space, kind of like like kind of like an airbag on the inside of the of the head, and that seems to work to limit the movement of the brain, and that's something helmet can't do. So I'm uh, very intrigued by that, sort of the mechanics of that. Uh, and and uh, if you eliminated the, the helmet, it really came about to reduce skull fractures and ear injuries and facial and dental injuries. If you took the helmet off, you wouldn't have hardly any more head-to-head -head contacts, and you wouldn't have the brain being suddenly stopped and sloshing. But for those reasons, it's not, it's not going to happen even though others, as you just did, have, have questioned that, would it be safer without helmets? But you don't think it'll ever actually happen just because of how much of a fundamental change the game would be? I don't. I don't. I don't know how you, what your dad thinks about that, but I don't think it's going to happen. I think the helmets are here to stay. They've gotten very big. They keep pushing more and more couch foam inside of it. Uh, but... Uh, you know, there's only a limit to what it can do. That Q, Q collie you mentioned, Dr. Bales, I think I could be totally wrong, but the, the most, I guess when I first noticed it, I think it was Luke Keekley, the Carolina Panthers linebacker wore it in the NFL. Now you see it sporadically. Um, why, why doesn't everybody wear that? Or why don't a lot more people wear that? Do you think it's just the information's not out, or is the what do you think that is? I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe the company could could tell you more about why. I think it's probably a grassroots effort. But first of all, the science is sort of hard to understand. It's not intuitive to think if you if you restrict blood return and venous blood from the brain back to the heart, if you restrict that somewhat, you just like a hydraulic system, you put more fluid in the system. Uh, certainly the, the NFL and the major sports in, uh, agencies have not adopt, made it mandatory or adopted it. Uh, so it's probably a number of factors. What would you like to see 
added to the concussion protocol, if anything? Uh, I, th- I think a lot has already occurred. You know, they have they have backup, especially neurology uh, or neurosurgery doctors on the sidelines, particularly the NFL. Uh, now, not not every level of play and every league can afford to have that that sort of uh, medical expertise. But I think the protocol is is pretty good. Uh, you know, if the if a concussion is, a, is suspected. They're taken. They're taken out of the game and evaluated. If there's any question, they don't go back that that year. I mean that that game. Uh, what happens over the course of a year? You know, depends on how many of those episodes they have. And of course, as we've talked about, to try to limit the number of repetitive impacts and injuries through reduction of head contact in practice. I have my own neurological problems, but I do worry about CTE. Would I know by now if I had it? Uh, I, I think so, because uh, most people would begin to manifest, you know, dementia or, or memory problems or cognitive, uh, which you don't seem to have at all, uh, by, by your age. So I, I mentioned earlier there's kind of two, two waves or two groups, the younger one in the 30s and 40s for emotional, behavioral, uh, psychological, psychiatric problems, and then in the 50s, 60s, 70s, more for dementia type stuff, behavior, um, cognitive problems, speech problems. When you say behavior, Dr. Bales, is that people acting in like in the movie or with the stereotypical way? I think the public, including myself, knows it would be like, is that like violent acts? Or you're saying... Uh, what kind of things would you see, like personality disorder type? Yeah, stuff? personality changes, memory loss, uh, not being able to find their way, uh, you know, in in something that used to be very familiar with them. Uh, typical dementia is more of the older age group, as you would see in someone with Alzheimer's, for instance. I know there's a couple really big name players now that people. Like a, one, people famously online always say, like with Antonio Brown, like he must have had CTE is why he had his career. He had all the talent in the world, but couldn't couldn't stay on a team. And then, and you know, kind of again, kind of famously or infamously, uh, took his pads off and ran off the field yeah. in the middle of the game. Is that? I know I, I'm not trying to get you to uh, diagnose him, but are those the kinds of things you see, or is that too? Is that almost too drastic? It certainly could be consistent with with that. Some of them have violent behavior, you, you know, homicidal, suicidal behavior, uh, drug or alcohol abuse is another common thing. It's hard to know any particular example without all the facts, of course, but uh, could could be consistent with that. And sometimes that's what you see: the irregular, uh, really unexplained behavior. And then, like uh, Aaron Hernandez, obviously the old uh, Patriots tight end. I, I think I could be wrong, but I think he was the youngest person to ever show CTE. Is that right? Yeah, he was certainly one of them. Yes, and and a very dramatic public example. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's about as dramatic as it gets. If you if you estimated, um, and I know maybe it wasn't you, but the the old Pittsburgh Steelers center had the hundred thousand hits to the head. What would you estimate? If you can ballpark it, what would you think with the rule changes? What do you think that number would be now for somebody who played in the NFL? I don't know, maybe six years or eight years or ten years. If if I'll make this more uh, uh, simpler, if my dad played then, and let's say he probably did around the same hundred thousand, what would you think if he played now? Do you think do you think head collisions are down? You know, fifty percent. You think they're down seventy five percent? I would say pro- probably seventy five percent. Because remember, as I as I said, in those days, there were a lot of teams were hitting five days a week in practice, pretty much full speed. Uh, and then we've gone to you know practicing in shells, thud thud uh, contact, and and very few, maybe one day a week full contact. And and so I think it's dramatically reduced. I'd say roughly seventy five percent, maybe a little bit more. Dr. Julian Bales, it's been a real pleasure, my friend. Thank you for your incredibly valuable time. If I ever do get brain implants, I am coming to you. I would not trust anyone in there just digging around but you. 
Okay. I hope I hope you do, and I hope there is something good. We're always on the lookout, and I will uh, certainly alert you if I hear of anything. Been a pleasure to be with uh, you and Troy, and let's do it again sometime. Dr. Bales, let me ask you one question before we, we wrap up here. So one of the things we're trying to do here is just to have like interesting conversations with interesting people, whether it's medical or non-medical, anything like that. Who is somebody that you know that you think um, – we should talk to or help tell their story or get their story out to more people. Uh, one of the most interesting is Joe Maroon, who was a Pittsburgh Steelers doctor for a long time. Uh, I don't know if you know of him. Uh, he, he's a retired neurosurgeon now, but he's still very active. Um, he, he's one that comes to mind is very thoughtful and, uh, and uh, has a lot of ideas and opinions and, and, Facts to back back it up. What is uh, he was a former college football player himself, so he knows the sport inside and out. I I look at him certainly. Awesome, awesome. Thanks so much. And like my dad said, thank you for your time. I've never had anybody. Uh, we haven't done a lot of episodes yet, but when you said you might be late because you're in the middle of a brain surgery, I was I was laughing. That was a new one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> some people may say that, but in my case, it was really true. Yeah. <laughs> right, great to be with you guys. Tim, I'll see you. We'll do it again anytime you want. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barkley Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the Northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to BarkleyDamon.com. I want to thank my partners at Barclay Damon for supporting this podcast and, of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com. For cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital, if you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.